So last week we were encouraged to walk in the Spirit and not after the flesh and concluded that we do this by abiding in the Word, in God's Word, and acknowledging the inner promptings that the Holy Spirit gives us in our day-to-day -day lives. And as I've told you before, if, if, if a Christian church in the modern era, in the modern day, um, airs, or I should, I should say, if they are seeking to honor God with their heart, the devil's going to try to get them off on one side of the road rather than the uh, or the other. If he can't get them to be complicit with sin, then he's going to try to get them on the wrong path to get rid of sin um, by either becoming so focused on the Holy Spirit that they have virtually no knowledge of what the Word of God tells them, or so focused on the Word of God that they can't hear the Spirit of God. See what I'm saying? They try to get over focused on one or the other. And the balance in the middle is where the truth is found. Amen. Uh, you can, you can, you think. Well, you know, how can a person be so focused on the word they can't hear the spirit of the word? You know, I've done it, and I know countless thousands. Uh, I don't know them personally, but I know of countless millions that have done that. You know, shows it right in the Bible. Yeah, the Pharisees and Sadducees were filled so with it, focused on the word, but they didn't. They didn't know, know anything about the word. That's right. And the spirit, the, the spirit that gives the revelation of what that word meant, they could not hear it, right? And then you have other people that are so focused on the spirit and the gifts of the spirit and spirit this, spirit that, that they really don't know what the spirit would say if he was in the room with them, speaking face to face with them, because the spirit would tell them the word. Again, they're not familiar with the word. And so, you know, it's a, it's a balance between the two. Um, every time we choose to side with our flesh over the Word of God and the voice of the Holy Spirit, the harder our hearts get and the harder it becomes to walk in the Spirit to the point where you rarely, if ever, hear His promptings at all. That is a dangerous place and it is mere inches away from that awful state of being cast out as a branch that we talked about last week as well. You cannot, now remember, you cannot be cast out as a branch uh, you know, uh, uh, let's put it this way: a, a person can't, a, a branch can't be. You can't be considered a branch that's cast out if you were never a branch to begin with, right? I mean, the only way you can cast out a branch is if you were one, right? So clearly, this is in reference to Christians. It can't be referred to someone else. So this serves as a sobering warning for those who believe that they can live a cavalier life, showing little concern over their relationship with God, their vine, and still be safe. It, the scriptures affirm that is not the truth, which is why it's so dangerous that this is not taught in a great number of churches. I would go so far to say in the majority of churches, though I can't say that conclusively, I would imagine probably that's more, more than likely true. So let's begin this week by going a little deeper into our understanding of the last few verses of chapter 5 before working through this last uh, bit that Paul has to say in this letter. So in, Gal in Galatians chapter 5, verses 24 through 26, we read it last week, it says, Now those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We spent a little bit of time with that as to how, how that can be true. If we live by the Spirit, let us also behave in accordance with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, being jealous of one another. Now that, that those words, provoking one another and jealous of one, jealous of one another, uh, you could substitute the word envy and strife there. And uh, because they're pretty much the same thing. And you'll find those exact same words showing up later on today as we're going through Scripture associated with people who are babies in Christ. They're infants. They're the ones that are still in the nursery with diapers on. Okay? If there is envy and if there's strife, you're an infant in Christ. Not even a child. A child in the Bible is a toddler. Someone who is growing and maturing. A person who still has envy and strife regular and active in their life, they're still in diapers. That's the word the Bible uses for it, okay? So it's in, do you think it's kind of important and do you think it's a good thing that God gave us an idea where we are just by looking at what's going on in our life, right? Amen? It's a good thing. And none of it's supposed to be condemning. It's just because, I mean, have you ever thought that you were further on than you really were? And what does that wind up doing? It winds up making you kind of relax and think, well, you know, I've, I've arrived. I don't, I don't have to work so hard. You know what I mean? And, 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 you know, we know we're not trying to work 
by our own power, but you get the idea, right? But, you know, it's good when we sometimes are defibrillated and realize, whoa, hey, wait a minute, you know, I have come a long way. I'm not going to deny what God's done in my life, but wow, I'm not as far as I thought I was. I've had many times like that in my life, amen? Several in the last several years. And so that's not a condemning thing. It's a healthy, good thing, amen? Because none of it's saying this is the permanent statement about you, Mark. It's just saying it's where you are right now. Now let's move on, right? Amen? That's what it's always there for. It's never to condemn. So I want to single out the one phrase that says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. I don't know about you, but you know when I read phrases like these in the Bible, sometimes I scratch my head because when I read the words, to me, the sentence by itself in English makes zero sense. Makes zero sense. Because it seems to me if I am living by the Spirit, I'm already walking by the Spirit. Because how could you live by the Spirit and not be walking by it? To me, it, it doesn't make any sense. But it's clearly saying one is different than the other. If you are living, then start walking. So clearly, these words have a different understanding meaning than I would have thought just upon, you know, first blush exposure to them, okay? So I want us to look at it just a little bit. Without the prior instructions Paul has covered in this letter, understanding these words right here in this verse would be very difficult, if not maybe impossible. The word live here is key, but cannot be fully understood without its counterpart, which is works. What we're talking about here is living by God's power rather than doing the right thing by a flesh effort, doing the works of the law, okay? Are you following? One is the polar opposite of the other. The word live is in the context of verse 25 means to be devoted to God, to live conforming yourself to the will, purpose, precepts, and example of God. But Paul does not end there. This is an if-then statement. He says, if you live, which is the word I just defined, by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. In other words, if due to the work of the Holy Spirit within your heart, you are devoted to God and attempt to conform yourself to His will, His purpose, His precepts, and His examples, then don't launch out on your own in an attempt to accomplish Christ in you, but rather follow, follow after and walk by the power the Spirit offers, which enables you to live a new life unto God, like being alive from the dead, right? We all know that in our right stand that in our right standing with God, which we have due to our you know to knowing and trusting Jesus as our um, as our sacrifice for sin, we are to consider ourselves or see ourselves in very practical ways as dead to sin. That's the way you're supposed to view yourself. If you're in Christ, you see yourself dead to sin in the same way that He died to sin, right? As it were, uh, um, you know, as as if it were relationship where we are now divorced from sin. A relationship, we used to have a relationship with sin, and now we are divorced from that relationship, and, um, and we, we have determined that we will no longer live in that. Okay, we, We've separated ourselves from that former relationship. This is what we do by faith. We do that by faith. Now, what does that mean? I mean, you hear statements like, you know, live by faith or, or, or walk according to the power of the Holy Spirit by faith. What does it mean to do that? How do you do that? Well, you know that once you were born again, according to 1 Corinthians 5, you guys are very familiar with that passage, and you can turn there if you want to, keep your finger here. But um, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we are, if you, we are now in Christ Jesus, and we are therefore in our vine. We have been reconciled to God. The wording there in 1 Corinthians um, uh, 5, 17 through 18 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, barring from John, he would say, if you are a branch in the vine. It's all different words to say the same thing. He said, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. And you're that new creation. That's what's happened. Something new has happened. Old things have passed, to be, passed away. And look, New things have come. Now everyone, everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ Jesus and has given to you and I that same ministry of reconciliation. Well, you're out now reconciling people to God in the same way that he reconciled you to himself, right? Now, if we were to back up a few verses, we learn something more. Let's back up to verse 14 and then read through, read through 18. It says, For Christ's love compels us. 
since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. Remember what we just said a minute ago? That, we, that we've determined, we made the decision to see ourselves dead with Christ, right? And we do that by faith. How do, we, how do I in my mind, how does what I think in my mind and what I believe in my heart have anything to do with it? In other words, how do I, how by faith do I see myself on that cross with Christ? How do you actually do that? You know what I mean? Well, here in 1 Corinthians 5.14, again, it says, For Christ's love compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all of us have died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. So here we see power and purpose. The power is the love which drives and empowers trust. The love of God compels us. It drives us to think this way. The love of God. Is it, any, is, it, is it really a big surprise or a big shocker to you that the way we do this is by loving God? No, it shouldn't be, right? Because he said, didn't he, what did he say? If you just, just love me, the rest of it will be taken care of, right? If you'll just be focused on love, then you don't have to worry about the ins and the outs and, and the entrappings of, of the Ten Commandments because you'll find yourself doing them. Because of your love for me. The love of God compels us. To, and, and, and because of the fact that we've, when we came to Christ, we made this de declaration. We made this um, announcement, if you will. It was a proclamation that if Jesus died, then I have. I don't do anything apart from Jesus. Right? If he dies, I die. If he rises, I rise. If he walks on water, I walk on water. It doesn't matter what it is. What Jesus does, I do. Right? Amen? Because he doesn't see separation. There is no separation. Okay, so, so he says here, he says, if I die, that the love of God is what compels me and drives me forward to that. That's the power is the love. What love drives, and love drives and empowers faith. Remember, faith works by love. So it's based upon a relationship. See, that love drives me to know the one who died for me. And to not only know him, but what did Paul say? He says, it's my great desire to know Jesus and his death and his crucifixion, to identify with him in his crucifixion, right? That I might also identify with him in his life, right? There's this great desire to know Christ in the, po in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings. The koinonia, the shared experience of having been on that cross. Amen? To know him. Paul said, you know, I've forsaken everything else. And that's a guy that could really say it and mean it, right? Mm -hmm. I have forsaken everything that I might gain Christ. And to be found, what is this words here? Even here it says, in him, right? Not having my own righteousness produced by my own works, apart from the law, apart from, um, uh, apart from the Spirit of God. I mean, yeah, apart from the Spirit of God. But instead, I want to know him and the power that causes me to live a new life in him and the fellowship of his sufferings on that cross. And not just the cross, but all the sufferings of Christ because Jesus had to die regularly. Before he physically died, he had to die in the garden, didn't he? Not my will but yours be done. What is that but a death? Amen. Amen. He had to die when he was around 12, when his parents sought him out and said, what the heck were you thinking? We've been, we were halfway back home and found you weren't with us. What's wrong with you? you know? And Jesus is like, you know, I thought you'd know. <laughs> I didn't realize you didn't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know? And instead of Jesus bowing up, he had to hoop tasso under his parents because he was still under their authority, right? Now, he told them the truth. I thought you'd know. I'm about my father's business in my father's house. But hey. If you say, I need to be with you, I'm going with you, right? So he had, to, he had to suffer a death there. I mean, he did this all the way through his life. Jesus, Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered, right? Jesus did, never sinned. doesn't say that Jesus never did anything that was not either socially or whatever the wrong thing to do, but when he heard it and when he had understanding, because what is sin? Sin is to know to do right and not do it. When there was understanding, he would never do that again. You never hear him wander away from his parents again, do you? Because he didn't, right? So, I mean, uh, it says before the child knew right from wrong, you know? So, I mean, Jesus had to grow in his knowledge just like anyone else. The problem, what, the difference is when he learned, he did not repeat. 
Amen? When he learned, he walked because he stayed in union. Amen? So, you know, now, so this power, this love is what we see here. I'm going to read it again. For Christ's love compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. So we have here, what we see here is both the power and the purpose of God. Because verse 15 gets to the purpose. And then it says, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who, uh, who, for died, who died for them. Right? So that's the purpose. But the power to get to that purpose is found in our love for him. At that love God draws, drives us to know him, not only in the power of his resurrection, but first and foremost in the fellowship of his sufferings, to see myself dead with him. Right? That when sin comes by, when I have the opportunity to sin, I see that as something that is foreign to me. I'm dead to that. That's not going to get a rise out of me. Right? Amen? You, you can have a person that, 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 that loved steak and walk it by their dead body in a casket, and you won't get a rise out of them. They won't respond to it. Why? Because they're dead to it. They can't respond to that. There's no association between that stake and them anymore. They're done. Right? This is exactly how we view sin. We are reconciled to cross on the, uh, Jesus on the cross so that we might be reconciled to Jesus in his resurrection. Amen? One precedes the other. But the purpose of it, as we just said, was that we should no longer live for ourselves. Now, so, so really... The purpose, um, uh, the, I, I've divided it kind of into two phases. Phase one of our salvation is simply to deal with sin. We become right with God when we stop attempting to save ourselves and place the whole of our faith and our reliance upon his provision for our sins. I mean, Romans 10 tells us that, uh, that uh, at, at that point, we have believed into right standing with God. That's the wording in Romans 10. You have believed into right standing with God. If you remember that passage in Isaiah that I brought up a few times lately, in Isaiah 55, 7, I told you it is a key to understanding God and the scriptures. It says, let the wicked abandon his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Right? Remember that? So what makes a person unrighteous is the way they think. What makes a person righteous is the way they think. What do we read in Romans, in Romans 10? I'll read it again. They believe, that has something to do with what's going on inside of their heart, right? They believe, they change their thinking and believe into right standing with God. That's what they believe in their heart. Before they believed, well, you know, all these things, I better make sure that the good ways outweighs the bad, or I make sure I need to make sure I'm circumcised in the covenant. I need to make sure that I keep the Ten Commandments as best I can, and, and at the end, and just to try to make sure that I offer sacrifice for everything I can, and at the end, shh, I sure hope that the good outweighs the bad. Well, you need to change your thinking, right? I believe in to right. What, what is that way of thinking? It's in rebellion towards God. It's trying to establish my own righteousness apart from him. It is in high rebellion against God. When I instead hoop tasso under the message of the gospel, which is you can't save yourself, but Christ has, then at that point I believe into right standing with God. I'm no longer um, hostile to his way of thinking. I'm in conformity to his way of thinking. That's what makes me in right standing. Are you following I mean, I, 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 I hope that helps you some because the word righteousness gets this religious connotation that becomes larger than life and it's hard to wrap your head around. But all it really means is just to be in right standing with God. And the way you do that is by thinking his thoughts. Stop thinking the way you used to think. The rest of that verse, remember those, those verses in Romans, uh, I'm sorry, in Isaiah 55, goes on to say, you know what, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways aren't your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts and my ways above your ways. The only way you're going to be right with him is when you start thinking his thoughts and pursuing his ways. Amen? Then at that point, there's righteousness. That's what Roman tells, tells us. Believed under right standing with God. Now, other than being spiritually dead, what was the condition then that made us right with God? It was the way that we thought. The invitation in Christ is to change the way you think about God, about sin, about salvation, about your own ability to do anything about your condition. It's about changing the way you think. The invitation is to come to God humbly in trust that he has met your need for acceptance with him. He has met it. Now, don't think that... Now, this is the, this is the travesty of the modern gospel where we get off of what the Bible says. 
People have no problem believing that, yeah, the work of Jesus Christ and not my work is what brings me into initial salvation that makes me a child of God. But where they leave off is the fact that it's that exact same relationship, that exact same set of conditions that caused me to live for Christ after I've come to him. You don't forsake this when you come to him. That's where you begin it. I've said it over and over and over again, but the truth of the matter is the power for living is in this. It's not in other things. I mean, I remember, again, when I was a young man growing up in a denominational church, and they were good people. They were good people. They loved God. They wanted to do the right thing. Now that I'm older and I look back on them, I remember their mannerisms, I remember the looks on their faces, I, I, rem I can tell now that they were confused in their faith. They're frustrated in their faith. They wanted to serve God, but they were living Romans chapter 7. The thing I want to do, I don't do, and the thing that I hate is the thing I habitually find myself doing. That's what the, the conundrum they found themselves in. And, and so adults found themselves in the uncomfortable position of having to correct young people when all in the while in their heart, their own heart was convicting them, saying, you're not doing better than this kid is. Hello? What a horrible condition. And I don't fault them. Those poor people wanted to walk the right way. They just didn't understand how. Now, could they have? Sure, it didn't require a different pastor. It just required getting out of their own thoughts and getting into the Word of God. They got a Bible. They got the Holy Spirit. They could have found the truth. But, you know, nonetheless, they still had a decent heart. They wanted to do the right thing. So I remember the frustration. I could see it on them. When I would sometimes ask questions, and uh, you wouldn't believe how many times. Just as a young man, I'd ask questions that would stump them. They had no answers for that. In fact, they'd never even wondered that before. They're like, well, where did this question come from? <laughs> you know, that's not in my, my, my teacher's guide. I've read the whole thing. I know that no one was supposed to ask me that question, you know? And, and they didn't have an answer for it because all they could do is just teach out of a book they didn't teach by the power of the Holy Spirit. They didn't understand the Word of God. They just had memorized it. You know what I mean? And so it really wasn't being all that effective. I mean, they were trying. Thank you, God, for them because they still made investments in me. I'll say that again. They still made investments in me. They made deposits in me that were solid and good, amen, and I'm grateful for them, and I'm grateful for the work that God did through them. But the invitation in Christ is to change the way you think about God, about sin, about salvation, about your own ability to do anything about your condition. The invitation is to come to God humbly in trust that he has met your need for acceptance with him. Romans 10, 10 again. With the heart one believes, resulting in right standing with God, and with the mouth one confesses, resulting in salvation. That is phase one of your salvation. Phase two is how you live after that, which is what Paul's been talking about in Galatians. Back in 2 Corinthians 5, going on now from 16 to 18 again, it says, From now on, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have come. Everything is of God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So as we go back here to Galatians, when it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. And you can turn back there now. This is essentially saying that if you have been made new by the Spirit and have therefore have changed and have an inner conviction and desire to live godly, if that is true, then don't attempt to live for God on your own. The same Spirit who brought you new life will also guide you and empower you to live that new life with Him. Hallelujah. Don't leave Him behind. The, believer, the, the Holy Spirit is the believer's best friend. In the same way that Jesus was the right hand of the Father. What does that word right hand mean again? It means the one who has the power that acts on behalf of the one who sent Him. It means ambassador. Well, what is the Holy Spirit but the ambassador of Jesus? He sent the Holy Spirit to take of what was his and reveal it to you and I. And then you and I, now, now listen to this, don't lose this, please don't lose this. The Holy Spirit is not the only ambassador. The Holy, in fact, the Holy Spirit is only an ambassador to the degree that you will cooperate with him because the, the ambassadorship is a shared ambassadorship. It's one that we do together with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't just go out and arbitrarily on his own usually do the convicting and the convincing of the world. He does it through one of his kids. We work together. Are you following? Yeah. 
It's just like in ministry, if you have someone that you co-minister with in the natural and you do everything in ministry together with them, you collaborate, you talk, you, you share, uh, make sure that you're sharing uh, the same vision, that you're on the same page and, and when you run into doctrinal issues, you don't just skip over them and skim over them, you spend time until you work those things out so that you can share one face before the world. This is exactly your relationship with the Holy Spirit right there. You do not go out on your own. You don't do what you do on your own. You do it with. Amen? If, again, any gospel that tells you to do for has forgotten the true gospel. Because the gospel is never for, it's always with. Always with. There is no for. There is no perform for God. It is perform with Him. This is relationship at its core. And if we teach it any other way, whether we intend to or not, and I believe most people have no intentions of doing it the wrong way, but the truth is you're teaching a false doctrine. It's not the truth. It, to, to perform for is to go back under the law. And we're not looking for that. It's not that the law was bad. It was good. It was spiritual. It was holy. It was all those things. But it was also a tutor that brought me to Christ. And now that I'm in the embrace of Christ, now that I'm a branch connected to my vine, I don't need to be under that rules anymore. Because now that I love Christ and I'm his, I begin to bear fruit of my, out of my union with him because my love, my love, the love that God has shed upon my heart that is given to me to, to love Christ with has compelled me to see myself as dead with Christ. Sin doesn't have power over me because I look at that thing and I'm like, I, I'm a dead guy. What does that got to do with me? I'm a dead guy. That sin's got nothing to do with me. Right? I see that. To see it that way. And I tell you, the only one that's got the ability to bring a revelation of that is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that convinces your heart of these things. Is essentially saying that if you have made the Spirit of God, been made new by the Spirit of God, and there have cha therefore have changed... Um, uh, and the inner conviction of the desire of your heart is to live godly. If that is true about you, then don't attempt to live for God on your own. The same Spirit who brought you to new life will also guide and empower you to live that new life with Him. You know, we read a verse last week in closing which stated that very clearly. It was found in Romans chapter 8. Um, it wasn't a verse. It was several verses. Verse 9 through 13. I'll read it to you. It says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. In chapter 5 in Galatians, what do we read? How the flesh is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit is contrary to the flesh, and these two are, are contrary to one another so that you can't do the things that you want, and the, the works of the flesh are manifest, and these are, they are these. And the works of the, or the fruit of the spirit are these, right? We just covered all those in chapter 5. And he's saying right here, if, however, you, however, are not in the flesh, that list we read in Galatians 5 doesn't apply to you because you're not in the flesh but in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his Spirit who lives in you. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you do that, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put the, deeds, the death the deeds of the body, you will live. So your faith for this is in a person, not in a fact. Your faith is not in, well, I believe that I die with Christ. Well, that is a true statement. And I'm not saying that's a bad statement, but that's not all of your faith. Your faith is not in that fact. It's in the power and the effectiveness of a person who's been given you to live this. My faith is in the work of the Holy Spirit. I believe in him. I believe that, remember, greater is he who is in you, not greater is the fact of your salvation, not greater is the facts of your gospel, but greater is he who is within you than he who is in the world. That's what's greater. Not the fact, the person. My faith is not, your faith, your faith can, be, uh, can be about things, but it can't be in things. Your faith is in a person. I might, I might believe my, 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 something that, that, I, that I'm putting out my faith to the Holy Spirit for, might be a changed life to begin to walk more like Christ. That's the end game of my faith. But the object of my faith is the Spirit of God. 
Amen? I trust that the one who was given to me is able to do what he was sent to do. I believe in his power to do this in me more than my belief in my ability to screw it up. I believe that. Does this begin to make some sense to you? How you actually do this? You don't leave faith at salvation. That's where you started. You just began to get your ears wet. You haven't really done much yet. You just got, you're welcome to the family, but here's phase two. And this will keep you busy until the end, right? Won't it? It'll keep you busy to the end. Your faith for this is in a person, not a fact. It is in the person of the Holy Spirit. It is in... Uh, it is imperative, especially in the days in which we live, to be careful to understand these truths which have been faithfully handed down to us over the centuries. It is easy to misunderstand the words themselves as well, um, as, well as to what ends they are pointing. But God is not over-occupied with our natural happiness. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. God's not over-occupied with your natural happiness. He's not preoccupied with merely your conduct. He's not just looking for you to act good. What God desires is intimacy. And yes, I've said it a million times, and I'll say it a million times again because it's what the Bible tells us. He's interested in life. Not life apart from you, but life with you, right? That's what God wants. I mean, how intimate are the words we've been reading in the book of Jeremiah? Oh, that my eyes were like fountains or like, like, uh, like uh, rivers or like waterfalls that I might, they might gush forth all of my heartbrokenness over Israel. Who talks like that? Who, who serves a God that thinks that way? I do. I do. Who, who, who talks about their heart being crushed and, 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 um, and, and being you know, downcast and grieved because of how his people are going into darkness and how their people, his people are being uh, brought into judgment? He doesn't want that for them. He adores them to remember that these things are important to God, which is why they were important to us. They, in the same way that we love God because he first loved us, these things became important to us because they were first important to him. It would have never occurred to me in a million years that a human could be intimate with God. Not without the Bible telling me that. I got news for you. First off, my flesh got going way too early. And I knew there were too many bad things about Mark to believe that God wanted anything to do with me. And then I look at the magnitude of all that he's done and all that he's made. And I'm thinking, you know what? I'm, I'm sure as intelligent as he is that he knows my name, but that's probably where the line's drawn. You know, I, I would not have been thinking intimacy. You know what I mean? That would not have been the first thought, the natural thought that comes to a human being's mind because we're too aware of ourselves. But God's like, you know what? I got something to say about that. Right? I think you about, about you in different terms. What he desires is intimacy, which requires true and lasting change. Not just inner change, and certainly not hypothetical theological change, but real, substantive change, which affects how we live. And we do this by faith. We have believed into a state of union with Christ in his death on the cross, which was a death to sin once for all. That is the part of our salvation that I called phase one earlier. All of that led to where God, what God was truly aiming at in sending his son into the world, and that was a life lived with him. So, we do not just see ourselves theoretically, theologically, hypothetically dead to sin due to Jesus dying for us. But we, like Paul, see ourselves as having died with him, and we do that by faith. I literally, and there's no way I can actually teach you to do it. You just have to do it. You literally begin to ask the Holy Spirit, enable me to see myself as having died with Christ. Enable my spiritual eyes, enlighten my spiritual eyes to not only see it, but believe that when Christ died, I died too. This is not just Jesus dying for, it's me dying with. Amen? Um, that's not to negate the fact that he, in fact, did die for. No one's taking away from that. That's a solid reality. But the only way it does mark any good is if I climb up on that cross and die with. Right? The initial, his death dealt with my sin, something I could not have died for myself. Amen? My dying with him is just an agreement that I died to sin through him. Okay? That's the difference between our deaths. Now, what does it mean, and how do we do it, you know? 
Well, we actively exercise our trust in God that he is able to cause us to be united with Jesus in his death even while we live. Once that has happened, we press on in our faith to believe that the same power of God and person of the Holy Spirit who physically raised Jesus back to natural life again is also actively and mightily at work within us to cause us to raise with him, to live with him in unbroken union with him, branches united to their vine. Now, what you tell me, what naturally happens when branches are connected to a healthy vine? It produces fruit. They grow and they produce fruit. Automatically. It's not that you notice the, the vine that you don't nothing nothing in the analogy in John 15 says, and if the branches uh, grunt and groan and push hard enough, then they can pop out a grape. No. He said, if you just abide, you'll bear the fruit. You see how work's been removed? It's been replaced by love, by trust. To believe that we have never been a source. You've never been the source. God didn't create you because he needed power. God didn't, God didn't create you because he needed a source for something to get done. God created you as an object of his love and as someone through whom he can express himself through. It's not your power. It's never about your power. The sin was when we acted on our own, independent. That's what all sin is, is separation. It's to act independent of. Amen? And we're done with that. We said we were done with that. Did we say that? When we came to Christ, in a sense, that's what we were saying. I'm done with independence. Well, then don't live like you believe independence is the rule of the day. It's not. You stopped that garbage when you met him. We do this by getting God's word into our hearts in abundance and by following after the spirit we've been made alive to. It's both. It's not either or. It's both and. We get the word of God in our heart in abundance. This is why I've told you, you know, that little cute little phrase, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little ears what you hear. You know, Christians that, are, that consider themselves mature, consider themselves mature, meaning they've been Christian for a long time, Consider little cute little phrases like that kind of, well, that's cutesy. But, you know, but they don't live it, by and large. They're not careful about what they, what they watch. They're not careful what they listen to. They're not careful about what they, uh, what they attend and the kind of people that they associate with. They're not careful. What did Paul tell us? He said, don't be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. And yet, Christians, I don't know about you, but I see her all around me. Christians do that with abandon. Not giving a first thought to it. Well, I'm safe. I'm born again. Are you? Have you even really met him? Because, you know, my Bible tells me if you really met him, you'd be living for him. And, and, and day by day, you'd be drawing closer to him and wanting to get further and further away from the effects of the world. There's a, there's a principle of life that's, a, that, that's been deposited on the inside of a believer that compels them and drives them towards love. And yeah, can you stifle that and, and, and almost silence that voice through a hardened heart and, and not following after God? Sure you can. Can you still be born again and that be the truth? Yeah, for a period of time. But you know what? You know, either, either that person's going to wind up dying prematurely, be reconciled back to God, or they will consider uh, continue on to the point where they're in stark rebellion and high-handed sin, and they will commit apostasy. In any of those cases, it's really not all that good of a story. I'd rather, I mean, even being restored is not a great story. I'd rather not need to be restored. How about that? Would that be better? Now, I mean, granted, we're going to need to be restored because we're going to screw up. There's no question about it. But I'd like to minimize that as much as possible. So if I really, really mean that when I say it, if I really, really mean Jesus, your Lord, then I have to do things that are proactive about that. I need to, instead of allowing just anything to have an equal share, an equal chance at depositing things, influencing my soul, I isolate the largest portion of my heart for God. You are not going to be able to shut yourself off from the world and God never asked you to. But what God did tell you to do is make sure that what's in abundance of your heart is me. You notice before Jesus would go out in ministry time and time again, what do we see that he did? He got up early in the morning before the disciples could say, oh, what are we doing? And what do we have for breakfast? And what are we doing now? And blah, blah. And all the, just silence all of that. Get up before they got up, went to a desert place and 
spent time talking with his father, connecting, speaking to and hearing from. Jesus needed that. Remember the guy who said, you know, that said, you know, my, um, uh, um, uh, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. Remember that situation? The disciples had gone into town and they went without Jesus because they didn't know where he was. He'd gone up early and gone off in a desert place to pray. And they went to town and they tried to cast out a demon. The demon couldn't be cast out by them. And they were perplexed. They didn't know what to do. And the de demon was flexing his muscles in front of them, making fun of the disciples. And the disciples were like, I don't know what to do. And then Jesus comes strolling into town. Right? And he said, you know, and the, the, the disciples we said, we, we don't understand. What's going on? We can't cast this guy out. We used your name. That's, that's always worked in the past. What's going on? And Jesus said, this kind doesn't come out except for by prayer and fasting. What had Jesus just been doing? Right? Who do you think led him to do that this morning? The Spirit. He was led by the Holy Spirit. What's that? Is that what you said? The Spirit? Yeah, the Father through the Spirit. That's right. Led him to do that. So he was ready. He didn't just go out. He made sure that what was in the abundance of his heart was his Father. Amen? You can't represent what you haven't spent time with. Right? I don't know about you, but if you try to sell a product that you're not familiar with, you're not going to no one's going to buy. Half the time, they don't even know what you're selling. Mm -hmm. I remember years ago when I was on the road, I guess I've told this to you maybe once or twice, um, I never used to have a problem with confidence at all. And uh, I, I, I had a friend of mine, and we were in business with another guy, and we were installing uh, software on the back end of people's servers to help people get jobs, to take job interviews remotely. They didn't have to actually physically be there. And uh, um, years and years, years, years ago, um, and... Uh, uh, you know, I learned the software, I'd learned everything, and we, I was graduating enough to they wanted me to go into the business um, meeting and pitch the product. I'm like, okay, I, I could do that. And I went in there with perfect confidence, but by the time when I sat down, I realized, you know what, I don't think I really know how much this costs, I don't think I know how much that, or, there's a lot of things I didn't know in my head, you know. And so when it came time to talk, David said, okay, and here's um, Mark, he's going to tell you about the product. I flatlined. I said nothing. <laughs> I wasn't embarrassed. I just looked at them and I just kind of looked around and said nothing because I had nothing to say. <laughs> and I, then after about two minutes of uncomfortable silence, I looked over at David and said, why don't you take it from here? <laughs> he just, and he took off and did the rest of it. And, you know, then I did a little bit more coaching and the next time I was able to take it without any trouble. But, uh, but why did that happen to me? Because I wasn't familiar. I thought I was familiar with the product. But I was from pro, with I was pro, um, uh, was familiar with the the job I did with it, but not with how to present it to a company. You see what I'm saying? And so I had nothing to say. If you have not spent time with the Holy Spirit, if you've not spent time with the Word of God, if you spent more time with the world than you have with Him, then when you're in front of the world, what do you have to share with the, to share with them? But what they already know, they don't need you to re reflect their own image back to themselves. They need you to reflect Jesus at them, right? So we do this by getting God's word into our hearts in abundance and by following after the spirit we've been made alive to instead of following after our flesh we have died to. It is, an, it is an absolute truth that if you have placed all, if we have placed all of our relational trust, all of our reliance upon Jesus and Jesus alone for our right standing before the Father, then the next step or phase two of your salvation is to live like you are right with God. We do this the exact same way that Noah and Enoch did it, the way Job, Abraham, and Sarah did it, the way Moses and Caleb and Joshua did it, the way David and the prophets did it, the way Jesus himself did it. We do it by the Spirit. If you think you can do it different than everybody else has done it, you're mistaken. You can't perform for, you must perform with. Period. That's just all there is to it. Now, this was the point Paul was making at the end of chapter 5 as his preamble into chapter 6. Obviously, we're not going to get as far as I was hoping in chapter 6, but we are getting in there. So, um, when we begin chapter, read chapter 6, go ahead and turn there, chapter 6, verse 1. When we begin to read chapter 6, you will likely think that at first, it's about siblings in Christ who get caught up in sin. But in reality, it's about the responsibility of those who are spiritual. That's what it's really about. And those who are spiritual are those who have matured for some time in phase two of their salvation, learning to walk by the Spirit. They live by the Spirit. But we'll look more at that in a moment. Let's go ahead and look in Galatians 6.1. It says, Brothers, if someone is caught, and the word caught means discovered or found out, in any wrongdoing, 
you who are spiritual should restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourself so that you do not be tempted also. Carry one another's burdens. In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is in fact nothing, he deceives himself. But each person should examine his own work, and then he will have a reason for boasting in himself alone and not in respect to someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Now, so these five verses, Paul is telling those who are spiritual that it is their responsibility in Christ to uplift the weak. It is everyone's, he's also saying that it's everyone's responsibility to carry one another's burdens. By carry, it means pretty much put up with, to bear up under. Does anybody in, any brother or sister in Christ that you know, rub you the wrong way? Okay? Bear with it. Is some of the things they do that rub you the wrong way sin? Probably. Bear with it. Don't be quick to judge them. Don't be quick to run away from them. Pray for them. If you're spiritual, restore them. Right? If you're not spiritual, don't try. You still need to be working on you. Right? What did he say here? You who are spiritual. Right? He does say that, does he not? Yes. Yeah, okay. I got one person paying attention. That's good. So, so Paul is telling us that those who are spiritual, that it is their responsibility in Christ to uplift the weak, but it's everyone's responsibility to carry one another's burdens because it fulfills the law of Christ. It's the same law that's found in Romans 8 at the very beginning of that chapter that says the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. It's that same law that made me free from the law of sin and death. It's everyone's responsibility to first take care of the beam in their own eye before they try to take the splinter out of their brothers, right? It's everyone's responsibility to hold themselves in no higher regard than anyone else. Regardless of how spiritual your walk is, you are not to live comparing yourself to one another, but only to Jesus, who is the only example for all of us. Because in the end, we will not stand before our siblings in Christ. We will stand before Christ himself. So that's my standard. I don't compare myself with other people, right? Now, who are those who are overtaken in a fault? Well, first off, let's look at the word fault. The word fault means sin, but it's often translated with this softer word because out of the two ways in which it could be translated, it may mean to fall by the wayside either by weakness or a lapse of good judgment or simply by being caught off guard. In other words, it's not a premeditated sin. It's not something that you knew it was sin when you went into it. It's something that caught you off guard and you reacted. Okay? Mm -hmm. Moore says this about this. He says, Paul's wording here speaks not of a determined, hardened sinner. Instead, the idea is of someone who has fallen into sin, finding themselves trapped in a place they would never have thought they would be. Overtaken contains the idea of falling. It is not the deliberate, the planned aspect of sin that is stressed here, but rather the unwitting element, mistake, rather than misdeed, is the force of the word, though without absolution of responsibility. You're still responsible. You're still responsible. It's just that this wasn't premeditated. It wasn't with a hardened heart. It wasn't with determination. Now, Quite on the opposite, but there's another way of translating this based on how you treat a verb in there that could actually make it a deliberate thing, and it's something that you were just caught and found out in the middle of something that is pretty heinous. It could be either one. But in the end, what difference does it make? You're still supposed, if you're the spiritual, restore them, regardless. Right? If you're the spiritual, restore them. So who is the spiritual? Well, I said it earlier that the one who is spiritual is the one who is spiritually mature. And who is that? Well, according to Romans 8, 14, which is usually translated so poorly that it's just absolutely embarrassing and uh, almost completely misleading, but in, because in most translations it says all those who are led by the Spirit are God's children. And while that is a truth, it's really not the truth Paul was aiming at in that verse. And, 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 and furthermore, and this is a big deal, because, you know, even though you're like, well, then if it is a truth, then what difference does it make if... if, if we're misunderstanding it. It's still telling us truth. Yes, but it's not telling us what Paul was trying to get to. You see what I'm saying? If, if When we restore its proper meaning in the verse, then everything Paul said before this and everything he's going to go say after this makes a ton more sense if you do it correctly. Do you know what I'm saying? So 
Yeah, is it a truth that all children of God are led by the Spirit of God in some way or another? Yes, that is a truth. It's not what Paul was talking about. And if you think that's what Paul was talking about, then the rest of the passage is just going to be watered down and not have the impact it was intending to have. Now, um, uh, this word for children or son, we've already turned, we've already run into it in Galatians here already. I didn't point it out at the time, but in Galatians 4, 5, when it said that God has sent forth his son to redeem those who are under the law so that we might be received, as, that we might receive the adoption as sons, those two words sons are huios. Huios is gender specific. Usually that's not the case in the Gospels, but it is here. Not because God is excluding women. He is not. The reason he used the word huios is to illustrate a point for all of his children. Okay? Do you understand that? Okay? Like if I'm trying to make a point to someone, say I'm trying to make a point to a young man, and I use a young lady as an example. I'm not excluding him from it. I'm just using her as an example so that he can understand what I'm saying. Are you following? In the same way, huios is being used because there's certain things that God, when God had a right, when, when that, that really weird, odd period in time, when God was allowed to tell man how they should behave, <coughs> actually happened, which was when God gave the law. God told us, this is how I want you to behave. It's the very thing that the world now looks at in the Bible and says it's hopelessly patriarchal. Yes, you're right, it is. And the reason it's patriarchal is because God is patriarchal. Period. Deal with it. You can like it or not like it. Quite frankly, I don't care. It's still the truth. Right? It is patriarchal. Which, by the way, doesn't make it hopeless. It's actually filled with hope because it's patriarchal. And so there are certain things that belong to the Son. One of them was the inheritance. Inheritance was never given to the daughters. It was given to the sons. It was divided based upon the <coughs> oldest down to the youngest. Unless there was an adopted son, then he shared an equal portion with the firstborn. All of which is very important, which is where Paul was going in Romans 8 at the time. We're not dealing with that, but I'm just bringing that up as a segue, oh, no, as, a, as a mention. But uh, the son was the inheritor. He's the one that inherited the estate. What, then how was the daughter taken care of? Because either she stayed at home underneath her father and therefore was provided for her whole life, or she married a man who he himself had received an inheritance. And so she partook of the inheritance of another family through her husband. God was not excluding the women. It's just that you realize if God had given the inheritance to both the, the sons and the daughters, then when the daughter got married, she's, she's reaping two inheritances, and the only got one. In fact, the son only gets half of one because he has to share it with his wife. So instead, he gave it to the sons, period. And then uh, any daughter that married into that, she received that inheritance as well. She didn't receive the inheritance of her father. She received from the inheritance of the father of the, son, the, the, the man that she married, right? Mm -hmm. There was a covering there. Everybody was provided for. It was a brilliant plan. And the most beautiful thing about it is it represented the Godhead, the father, the son, the spirit. There's a terrace there. Of authority isn't there right and so it represents it's god did these things on purpose it's not like he did he he should have had an aha moment and realized oh i should have done that different no he did it on purpose and it's not something that was a result of the fall he did that from the beginning remember god did not make man for woman he made woman for man he, i mean it's from the beginning it's always been this way right our distortions especially in the modern era is 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 doing everything it can to do to to take a wrecking ball to that and you know I, i'm hoping that see that you can see in our covering of what we're talking about how important gender is then are you seeing that this word son if you do not understand it in the right and proper context you will not understand what paul is aiming at do you see why the devil is being deliberate to see to it that gender distinctions are so blurred why do you think he worked so hard to make fathers not be, be non-resident fathers for generations in this country? Because it, we have two or three generations of children who have a, a, an innate distrust of fathers. And so when you start telling them about the father God, immediately they recoil. That wasn't by accident. That was on purpose. I mean, the, the, the sad thing is that Christians are so dumb sometimes that we don't realize that what the devil does, he's doing on purpose. And we just let him do it unchecked and unaddressed well we can't do that paul always addressed issues when he ran into them so we must as well amen 
So this word son is gender specific. And the reason why it's being brought up that way is because the fact that the son is the one who carried the family name and represented the father. The daughter didn't, the son did. Where do you think we got the tradition that's actually pretty global that when a woman marries, she leaves her former last name and takes on the last name of the family she's marrying into? Because the son of that family carries forward that family name. She will be the womb through which that father's name is carried forward. She doesn't carry her family name forward. She carries the family name of her father because she's not the head. He is. She's the helper. She's helping him carry the family name forward. Are you following? The name carried with him. It's not because he was more important than her. Because what we hear from the very beginning, he made her to be a co-companion helper. Co-companion means as far as abilities and intellect and, and you know just pure personhood, you're equals. That's the reason why the Bible says she has to place herself under voluntarily because it's not like she couldn't act unilaterally. She could do these things on her own if she had to. God's not saying she's less than by any means. That's the reason why the word is used as a connecto where it says that she's called alongside, as, alongside him as his companion helper. Amen. Now we've dumbed down even that word because now we call dogs our companions. Now I understand they keep you company, but they're really not really companions. People are companions. I'm not saying that they don't, they don't keep you company and they're not wonderful things to have around because they are. They truly are. There's no question a gift from God. But, you know, you can't have true fellowship, not like a human being, with an animal. It doesn't work that way. Right? God did not give Adam an animal. He gave him a human being who was equal with him. Amen? But she came alongside him to aid him. So this huios means someone who represents the father. So when we read that word, when he says, those who are led by this, uh, so those that are, the word led there actually is in the continuous present. It means those who are habitually led by the Spirit of God, these are God's mature sons, the ones who act like and represent their father. Now, he's not saying the daughters of God can't do that. He was just using a word, huios, that m conveyed a meaning. It meant someone who represents the father. When they show up, you don't just see this person, you see the family they represent. You ever seen this when it comes to do with a firm, uh, especially in a law firm where you've got a, a father, son, and the father's retiring, but, you know, that family name, that last name, you know, say it was, the, you know, Woodson and whatever, Woodson and Sons, right? Um, then when the, up to this point, every time someone thought about Woodson, they were thinking about your dad. But now that he's retiring and you're taking his shoes... When people come in, they're expecting to see dad, but they see you. But they understand now, hey, the baton's been ta passed, and he represents that what's the name now. Are you following? That is what's being said by son. It just meant, means you, this part is not gender specific. You, as daughters and sons, if you are mature, you are habitually led by the Spirit of God. God's mature children, regardless of gender, they are always led by the Spirit. They don't have just on days. They live this way. That's the mature son. That's the mature daughter. Are you following? So that's what he's getting at when he says that. So, um, so when Paul uses this word, it has something to do with the father being represented in the son and, uh, or in the child of God. And as such, it is also implied maturity has been reached. So in Romans 8.14, we are being told that those children, in reality, regardless of gender, who are constantly being led by the Spirit of God, have reached maturity in Christ. These are the same, this is the same idea of being led that we read back there in Galatians 5.25 this morning. Those, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk or be led by the Spirit. Be mature. Also, to illustrate this word spiritual, I'll illustrate it from the negative now. 1 Corinthians, you don't have to turn there because it's going to be brief. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it says, Brothers, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people. Same word we're talking about in Galatians, right? As spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies or mere infants in Christ. I fed you with milk and not solid food because you were not able to receive it. In fact, you're still not able to receive it because you are still fleshly. Are you seeing connections with what we read in Galatians? Yes, okay. He says, for since there is envy and strife 
among you. You Are you not fleshly and living like ordinary, unchanged people? You're babies in Christ, right? Remember I told you earlier that passage at the end of Galatians 5 that brought jealousy and strife is the same thing here. Envy and strife. He says, you're a baby. Now these spiritually mature Christians are to bring the erring brother back on the right course with a gentle spirit. They are not to come down on them harshly, but to encourage them towards reconciliation and redeemed living. There are times when harshness is necessary, but this is not one of those times. Now let's continue back uh, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will from, reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Now, you may think that I missed verse 6, but I did it on purpose. I read verse 7 and 8 on purpose in order to shock your thinking. All We all know these, uh, these verses, and while they have many authentic applications, the one which Paul actually uses this admonition about, you might find very surprising. It is, in fact, in regard to giving to the support of your spiritual leaders. The same spiritual people who are restoring people who are overtaken in a fault. He hasn't left the discussion. What does he say here? So let's go back to verse 6 and read on to verse 8. The one who is taught the message must share his goods with the teacher. Don't be deceived about this. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. Because the one who sows to the flesh will reap corruption from the flesh, but the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. You see how he's talking about what you're sowing? He's talking, particularly talking about giving to those people who are spiritual in your life, who are the spiritual leaders, the very ones who pick you up when you fall. Amen? I mean, I didn't write that. It's right there, Right? Then Paul encourages them regarding their giving. In verse 9, he says, So we must not get tired of doing what is good. For we will reap at a proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity. When do we do this? As we have opportunity. You know, I understand, like in this church, there's some people who don't have an opportunity or have very little. And so we understand that. No one's expecting anything out of that. You know what I mean? But... He says, as you have opportunity, we must work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Now, he says, we will reap. Reap what? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, we are told what we will reap in our giving in 2 Corinthians 9. Now, you don't have to turn there because I made a short bullet point of it, but you can go back and check it. Okay? It tells us the reaping that we will reap the follow. We will reap sparingly, if we sow sparingly, Generously, if we sow that way, we will reap God's grace which will overflow so that in every way you will always have everything you need to excel in good works. Wow. Wow. Everything you need to excel in good works. Your righteousness will stand forever. Pastor Mark, are you sure this is associated with giving? Yeah, directly. Go check it out. Your righteousness will stand forever. He will multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your right standing with God. You will be enriched in every way towards all generosity, which will result in thanksgiving being shouted out to God by others. It will be paid forward in many acts of thanksgiving to God. Others will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of Jesus as Lord by your giving. Those benefited will lift you up before God in prayer with deep affection and according to this verse in Galatians 6.6, 6, you will reap further intimacy with God. By anyone's account, this is an amazing return for your giving. Would you not agree? However, God is not mocked. If instead of giving to the support of those spiritual leaders, who, by the way, are the very ones who pick you up and, and aid you in stabilizing your walk after you've been overtaken in a fault, if instead of giving into their lives, you spend what you have on yourself, on your own fleshly appetites and desires, you will, from the flesh, reap a harvest of corruption. What's corruption mean? Well, it means spoiling, ruin, decay, destruction, generally a fraying or wasting away to the point that eventuates in death. It's the word phthora, and it's number 5356 in your Greek concordance. You can look it up yourself. 
It isn't a pretty or appealing prospect. There's no, no, no two ends of that. Now, Paul ends his letter of admonition <clears throat> and correction and instruction towards righteousness with these words. And we're going to speed through this because we're at the end. He says, look at what large letters I've written to you in my own writing. Those who want to make a good showing in the flesh are the very ones that are wanting to compel you to be circumcised, but only to avoid being persecuted for the, uh, for the cross of Christ. For even the circumcised don't keep the law themselves. However, they want you to be circumcised in order to boast about your flesh. In other words, if you become circumcised, you won't be persecuted by the Jews who don't believe in Jesus. So to avoid persecution, go ahead and get per, uh, circumcised. But he, Paul's telling them, don't do that because you're preaching a foreign gospel when you do that, right? You ought rather be persecuted. Amen? He says, but as for me, I will never boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For both circumcision and uncircumcision mean nothing. What matters instead is a new creation. That thing we read about in 1 Corinthians 5. May peace be on all those who follow this standard. What standard? The standard that says, I'm not going to boast in anything except for the cross of Jesus Christ because by that cross I've been crucified to the world and the world's been crucified to me and I recognize that the only thing that matters now is a new creation. Those who live and follow that standard, let peace be on them. Right? From now on, let no one cause me any trouble because I carry the marks of Jesus on my body. Brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So my closing thoughts on this are I think the greatest portion of what Paul was saying in this letter is that we have in Christ Jesus, that what we have in Christ Jesus is in truth a relationship and relationships go both ways. It's not just God's investment into us, but our committed response to his investment. We must remember that in the end, we are told that Jesus doesn't ask us what we believed. He asks us what we did when we stand before him. Were, were our actions born out of our union with him? Did we conduct our lives in compliance and in step with the spirit he gave us? Or did we uh, live as mere unchanged people? If we live, if we have the spirit of God, we are to conduct our lives by his inner guidance, influence, and leading. If we do, we will be God's mature children who represent the family well and receive our inheritance. Amen? And what is our inheritance? God. God's my inheritance. 